Hello, everyone, and welcome to Collaboration and Resilience through Connected Digital Twins, the Credo Show and Tell webinar. I'm your host, Kirsten Lamb, and I am a communication manager for the National Digital Twin Program. The program launched its Climate Resilience Dem Demonstrator Project, or Credo for short, at a webinar at the beginning of November um, last year during COP26. Today, we'll be hearing from people involved in this exciting project um, about the findings, benefits, and lessons learned over the last few months. It's very timely, as I'm sure you know, this week's IPCC report on climate adaptation warns us that half of humanity is an immediate risk from the climate emergency. And Credo explores how collaboration and connected data can make us more resilient in the face of that risk. First though, a bit of housekeeping. If you could please use the Q&A function to ask questions rather than the chat, as we won't be taking questions from the chat. You'll find it just at the bottom of your screen. A recording of this webinar will be shared publicly on the Digital Twin Hub. So just be aware of that if you're putting your name in any questions that you ask. And finally, if you want to follow along um, and post your thoughts, you can use hashtag Credo and hashtag NDT program on both Twitter and LinkedIn. So now I'd like to hand over to our first presenter, Sarah Hayes, who's the project lead for Credo. And she's going to tell you more about how the project has developed. Over to you, Sarah. Thank you, Kirsten. So first slide, thank you, Rachel. At the last webinar, we started with a film and we told the story of why we're building the Credo Digital Twin and why it matters. We showed the film of Grandad and the flood and possible futures where he loses power and communications and the consequences are potentially catastrophic for him. Setting out why we need a digital twin like Credo. So since the webinar, we've been building the initial blocks of the Credo digital twin. And this webinar is all about showing you where we've got to and sharing our learnings. Next slide, please. The Credo is a climate change adaptation digital twin. It brings together data across energy, water and telecoms networks. We've been working with Anglian Water, BT and UK Power Networks, who've been fantastic in bringing their people and their data into the Credo Digital Twin. So they've helped us build this Credo Digital Twin. And what we've done is we've combined asset data with flood data so that we can understand the impact of future flood scenarios on an infrastructure system. So we can use the, the Credo Digital Twin to understand infrastructure interdependencies. We can see when assets fail and how the, the failure of those assets propagate across the system. So we can see the impact of a future flood scenario on the whole infrastructure system. And this helps us think about the questions of what can we do to prepare or respond? So what can we do in advance to protect key infrastructure assets across the whole system? And then if we were to, to integrate a, a live data stream, how could we respond in the future? How could we respond to future climate change events and um, in an emergency situation? So this really helps us think about the big questions of, of how do we increase system resilience? So how do we think about system resilience rather than just network resilience? And therefore, how do we start thinking about how to adapt to climate change? Next slide. So Credo is a project with many different elements. We have the asset owners and their data. We have the Science and Technology Facilities Council, the work of Hartree and Daphne in looking after the data. We have Connected Places Catapult and CMCL Innovations building the digital twin. The work of the IMF team and the work of the research teams and Mott McDonald supporting the research team and also the Joint Center of Excellence in Environmental Intelligence in getting the flood data into the Credo digital twin. We have the app and the film and a piece of work on benefits is underway at the moment and you're going to hear a little bit more about that later on. And of course, let's not forget the legal agreements which enabled us to kick off the project in the first place. So today we're going to focus on the pink areas, but I just wanted to give you a flavour that there are many different elements to the Credo project. Next slide, please. And we are publishing a number of outputs on the Digital Twin Hub this week and over the coming weeks. So there are a number of tech and technical reports which have already been published on the Digital Twin Hub. And some other reports will be forthcoming over the next few weeks. 
So today you're going to see the visualization with synthetic data, which we're all very excited about. Jethro will be presenting that shortly. And this visualization will be available to you on the DT Hub, as will all these other resources, which will be published over the time. So you will actually have access to the synthetic data in due course. Next slide. And all this is possible because of the Credo team. We talk about the National Digital Twin Programme being a socio-technical change programme. Credo is a socio-technical project, and we've been incorporating both the, the technical and the social elements of digital twins with the data sharing agreements, working across different teams and communications. We really are working at the intersection of research and innovation with a BDI on deployment in the future. And it is all about collaboration. So I would really like to say a big thank you to the whole Credo team today. And it isn't just about the people who are presenting at the webinar today. There's, there's a whole team of people who are working behind the scenes on the Credo project. So a big thank you to the Credo team. Thank you, Kirsten, back to you. Thanks, and yeah, thanks to everyone pictured there. Um, now we'll hear from Credo's technical architect, Tom Collingwood, in a pre-recorded se session uh, presentation, talking about the technical development of the project. So uh, Rachel, if you can play that video for us, please. Hi, I'm Tom Collingwood. I work at the Hartree Center, which is part of the Science and Technology Facilities Council, and I'm the technical architect for Credo. I'm here to give an overview of the technical work we've developed during this initial phase, which I'm really proud of, and I'm confident is the start of something much bigger. So back in November, I presented at the COP26 webinar where our development work was really just getting started. Uh, the demonstrator app that we showed during that webinar was a vision of where we wanted to get to, and we've had less than four months of technical delivery time since then, but we've made great progress in the meantime. We've managed that by running a lot of work in parallel. Uh, we had an agreed specification for our end goals. So we were able to divide the work up with a, a minimum of duplication. It was a huge effort that went into this in November and December last year. And we had a project shut down over Christmas to give everyone a well-earned break. Then we've been finishing off and wrapping that up on this side of, the, of Christmas. So let's get to it. I'd like to walk you through the flow of information in our connected digital twin. And to do that, I've drawn up some overly simplified diagrams. There's a number of intermediate steps in this that I'm leaving off the diagrams. And for a complete picture, we've written a series of technical reports which cover this in far more detail than I can cover in a short video. So to get us started, we've developed and hosted everything on DAFNI, which is the Data and Analytics Facility for National Infrastructure. That provides more storage and compute capability than we'd ever need in a project of this scale, and it really does fit as a, as a good partner for this kind of work in future. In addition to the existing Daphne portal and the data store that they had before this project began, we provisioned a secure asset data storage environment, which meant we could all work on the same data collaboratively across our distributed team without having to send copies of, of infrastructure data anywhere but the servers that we were working on. The next step on our journey was to load the data from the asset owners into that secure storage. This was done manually, by which I mean some of it was shared online, some of it was sent with encrypted hardware, and we did that in a single initial data release. This wasn't a simple export job for the asset owners necessarily. There was some considerable cleaning, tidying, and joining of that data was required on their part before it was ready for us to use. That's feasible within the limited geographical scope that we're looking at here, but a more robust approach is needed for this to be done at scale. That's where the continued development of the information management framework is heading, and that's a real enabler for this to work at that, that bigger scale in future. At the same time, the Joint Center of Excellence for Environmental Intelligence loaded climate data that they derived from UK CP18 climate projections onto the main platform. Now, without climate data, this project wouldn't be doing much in the way of contributing towards climate resilience, so this is a, a pretty vital step. Uh, with that, we had uh, environment agency flood data too, which covers the depth and the extent of some pretty extreme coastal and river flooding. We're talking about things like a one in a thousand year flood that's coupled with more than a metre of sea level increase versus today's levels. So that's pretty wet by most standards. A limitation of that, though, is the kind of binary status of it. So you get the depth and you get the extent, but it's either all there or it's not there at all. Uh, in the real world, floods don't just appear instantly, they develop over time. And even flash floods, uh, they, they develop quickly, but they do develop. It's not nothing one second and then they're the next. 
to kind of try and fill the gap there and to address it, we've wrapped up an open source rainfall flood model, which is known as HIPIMS. And we've completed multiple flood modeling runs on Daphne. So we've generated rainfall based flood data. And with that, we can configure timestamps. So we've curated outputs into a, a database of flood scenarios, which we can then use as inputs to our connected digital twin. Some of these are relatively benign using today's design storms, which go from one to 23 hour durations. Others are a lot more severe where we've added in uplift due to climate change and you get quite a bit more rainfall in, the, in those periods. In terms of the sheer volume of water that we see, these aren't quite as nasty as those coastal environment agency flood data, but they're still bad enough to knock infrastructure assets offline. Uh, and that's that's what we really needed to see. And we then had the temporal data so we can step through and see hour by hour as a storm progresses, what that means for the assets on the ground. As a result of our work, that HIPIMS flood model is available for the public to run as well, either directly on Daphne or through the way we've wrapped this up. Any containerized deployment platform that we've got can, can run this too. So it's a kind of a, a side bonus of the work that we've done here. We've made it a little bit easier for people to do more of this kind of modeling in the future. Once we've got that flood and asset information in place, the next step was to represent them inside our connected digital twin. This is where CMCL innovations have provided an underlying knowledge graph, which is the enabling technology behind all of this. The knowledge graph represents the assets, the connections between them and the flood data for a selected scenario. We do that by mapping the data to an extensible ontology during ingestion, which lays the foundations for future expansion and is a key area for more work with the information management framework in the future. Once the data is loaded into the knowledge graph, we're then able to prepare it for visualization to check everything looks sensible. We did that, first of all, to select areas of interest for more specific flood modeling. So we could see where there looked like there'd be some puddles around some assets. Uh, and in order to keep those expensive model runs limited to an area which promised to show us some more interesting effects, that was, that was a really key step in making this all work. So with this in place, we now have a simple cycle where we can load data, we can get it ready for visualization, but it's not much fun just showing which assets are going to be a bit wet. The next step is to model the impact of flooding on each asset. Uh, and that's where we developed an asset failure model. So what this does is it provides a probabilistic estimation of whether each asset is going to fail for a given scenario. So this was developed in collaboration with asset owner staff, which included running expert elicitation workshops to identify important parameters which contribute to asset failure. And some of these are included within our knowledge graph, things like flood depth are quite an obvious one that you really need. Others aren't in there necessarily. So that's things like the availability of fuel for backup generators, which you need if your power has just been knocked out. Now, using the Bayesian network modeling approach that we've taken here, we can account for information that isn't contained within the data already using prior assumptions. And then in future, if we ingest more data into the digital twin, we can update those models with those new observations as the data sources are integrated. That brings benefits on two fronts. It, first of all, it helps us to identify which useful data sources we should go after next. And secondly, it helps us to capture the expert judgments from the people who run these assets, what's in their head. And it gives us a sensible estimate for how likely these things are to happen in the meantime. So we can get some quite good results from relatively little data by accounting for it in this method. This model's been written in a, I'd say, a particularly tidy manner as well. So if you want to update these models to add more parameters in the future or to change the probabilities within them, it's a case of modifying a single text file and then that cascades through to how the model is structured and how it runs, which is a, it's a really tidy way to do. So that gives us a view of which individual assets have been knocked offline by a flood. And the next step is to see what that means for the bigger picture. That's where our system-wide impact model takes in those new asset statuses, along with the connections between them, and it propagates the loss of power, comms, and water, both within an individual network and across those networks. And that's that novel view that taking each asset owner's data in isolation can never really provide. From this, we develop a list of all the assets which have been knocked offline as a result of other assets being flooded. So that can be the drier assets on higher ground, which no longer have power or water or communications and are now offline. It's worth mentioning that we actually have multiple models available for both this step and the previous step. And CMCL's knowledge graph is able to select which model we want to run for specific assets. So that's, that bodes really well for future extensibility. Uh, and we might also run these more than once. 
So for the EA data, the Environment Agency data with that single time step, we were effectively done by this stage. But for the HYPIMS data where we have multiple time steps, we'll run through this in loops. So we might do this every hour for a 23 hour storm. And we step through, feed in the latest state back into the asset failure models and then run through until we've got the entire thing uh, resolved uh, for whatever time frame that we're, we're looking at. Once that's done, then the data is ready for visualization. And we've had one run around that big loop from one to four on, on the slide. Uh, we can show that straight away, or what we actually choose to do is rack up multiple runs. So we can feed in dozens of flood simulations and for a single set of asset data, we can show what would happen to it in a range of different uh, scenarios. And we can run these at our leisure and then we can fire up a, a visualization as soon as we want to and, and just call these out from the data store when we need them, which is, is a really helpful way to do this. So in our application, the knowledge graph is, is effectively ephemeral. Once we've finished a loop, we destroy it and we create a new one at the start of the next loop. There are other ways to run with the knowledge graph, which can be more long lived, but for this use case, it suits us perfectly. This bit here is where the glamorous stuff arrives, I guess, and I won't go into the details of the visualization. Instead, I'll say that this is how we make the results real for the resilience planners at the asset owner networks. There's huge efforts that have gone into data interoperability and modeling, and they all support this interactive outcome. So the visualization step is really the, the tip of the iceberg. And as the visualization yields more insights into how the system behaves for a given set of inputs, richer evidence can be given to the asset owners and fed into their resilient planning discussions, both within and between their networks. And this is the culmination of taking that data as inputs, developing the insights through that simulation and sense making, and ultimately providing visualizations to support future facing decisions. In the long run, you might even get a feedback loop here too. So the outcome of those decision supports can impact the shape of the assets networks. And, and that goes back in on the left-hand side of the, of the diagram again. And the same for flood scenarios. You may find you want to model different scenarios off the back of what you're seeing in here. That's all entirely possible. There's a lot more complexity behind this, this simplified diagram, uh, including a lot of data manipulation uh, as information moves from one area to another. The modular layout here is also very intentional. So it's what, as I said, enabled us to deliver all of this in parallel in under four months. It's what enables individuals to own discrete elements of the stack moving forward. So different models can belong to different people. And finally, it's what enables us to iteratively improve on each and every aspect of this in the future. Uh, so we can just keep racking up new ideas, new implementations, new data sources, all of that can be implemented into this modular structure with relative ease. So that's the high level tour done. Uh, as mentioned earlier, we're publishing detailed technical reports for all of this. So please do keep an eye out for them. And please get in touch if you have any questions or if you want to get involved. Thanks a lot. Wonderful. Thanks to Tom for that presentation. Um, as he mentioned, you can find more details about the technical development um, on the Digital Twin Hub, um, as the Credo team have produced a series of technical reports that have just been published today. And they describe in detail how this work was done. Next up, we're going to have Jethro Aykroyd from CMCL Innovations giving us a demonstration of the project model. So if we can hand over control uh, to Jethro, um, that'll be great. Thanks, Kirsten. Okay, I should now share, share my screen. Um, it would be very helpful if someone could confirm that it's all working okay. Yes, we can see it. Excellent. So I'm Jethro Aykroyd. I led the team at CMCL Innovations that implemented the knowledge graph based aspects of the Credo Digital Twin. And it's my pleasure today to demonstrate the visualization that has been developed to allow people to explore output from the Digital Twin. So the visualization is map based and it can be accessed using a standard web browser. And zooming in, um, you can see that the Visualization of the digital twin contains information about the assets from the communications, water, and power networks. And the, the assets are able to be shown on the map along with the logical connectivity between the assets. And at this point, I should emphasize that what you're seeing today is synthetic data. So whilst the Digital Twin was developed using real asset data. What you can currently see on the demonstration is synthetic data that was created 
to share the same characteristics as the real data. So the same types of assets and the same patterns of connectivity, but the names and locations of the assets and the connections between them on what you can currently see are entirely fictional. And what is now on screen in many ways resembles the data structure of the knowledge graph that forms the basis of the digital twin. So the assets are represented as nodes in the knowledge graph and the connections between the assets are represented as directed edges in the knowledge graph. And we chose this design because it's well suited to representing the arbitrarily structured data such as the, the connections between the assets. And underlying this knowledge graph is a hierarchy of ontologies. At the top of this hierarchy, the Credo Digital Twin uses a core asset ontology that we use to define generic concepts for assets and connections. And we then have domain ontologies that define specializations of these concepts for each of the water, telecoms, and power networks. So the details of the types of assets in each network are defined by the domain ontologies, whereas the business logic of the digital twin, so in other words, the code that operates on the data is as far as possible written in terms of the higher level ontology. And this design confers several advantages. Firstly, it provides abstraction. So the ability to define the business logic in terms of the higher level ontology is the basis of how we have enabled the interoperability between the data from the different networks. Secondly, the design is extensible. It's easy to extend the domain ontologies to add new types of assets or even new domains without disturbing the rest of the digital twin. But getting back to the topic of climate resilience, the digital, digital twin and the visualization allows you to explore how the assets respond to different flood scenarios. And we're going to look at an example of a one in 100 year, year storm under worst case climate projections for the year 2070. And the flood simulations output data every hour, albeit conveniently denominated in seconds. And I'm going to cherry pick the most interesting time point. You should now be able to see the depth of the flood water represented on the map with light blue corresponding to shallow water and dark blue corresponding to deeper water. And we can select, well, and you will also see that many of the assets are now surrounded by red rings. These rings indicate that the assets have experienced some, some sort of failure. And we can click on an asset to find out more about it. So having, having clicked on an asset, you can see that the visualization brings up a sidebar telling us what the digital twin knows about the asset. So this includes the name of the asset. In this case, I've selected a secondary substation. It includes an ID of the asset, and it includes a criticality score. And the criticality score is really a first attempt to understand the relative importance of each asset. In the current digital twin, it's calculated by counting the number of direct and indirect connections to the things that depend on the asset. So it's broadly proportional, to the number of things that would have a problem if the asset failed. And in the future, we anticipate that we would extend the visualization to demonstrate this criticality visually on the map. The sidebar also includes information about the operational state of the asset. So here, we can see that the power state of this secondary substation is false. So this tells us that the secondary substation is no longer receiving mains power. However, we can also see that the water depth is negligible at the current time point in this flood. So something else must be going on. And we can use the digital twin to help us try and find out what's happening. So here we can see the time history 
of the operational state of the asset throughout the flood. And we're currently looking at the power state. So we can see that it goes from being true um, during the beginning of the storm, and then suddenly the secondary substation loses power partway through the storm. So it's useful to have a look at the flood depth to try and figure out what's going on and square this up with our observation that the flood water was really very shallow. And we can see that borne out in this chart. We're looking at the flood depth on the vertical axis as a function of time on the horizontal axis. And if you're able to read the scale on the vertical axis, you will see that the maximum flood depth is substantially less than a millimeter. So this asset has barely got its feet wet. There's clearly something else going on. And in order to get to the bottom of this, we can view the direct connections to the assets or to the asset to get more information. So having selected view direct connections, we can now see that the secondary substation that we originally selected is supplied or has two possible supply routes, one from the primary substation at the bottom of the screen and the other from a primary substation at the top of the screen. And if I interrogate these primary substations, I can see that they are both substantially underwater. So the one at the top of the screen is under about, or under more than half a meter of water, whilst the one at the bottom of the screen is under more than a meter of water. So both of these primary substations are substantially underwater. Because of this, they both fail. And because of they both fail, then despite the apparent resilience in the design of this synthetic data network, neither of them are able to supply power to the secondary substation that we originally selected. And this secondary substation itself loses power. And having gone back to the detailed connection view for the secondary substation, you can see that it supplies power to two uh, sewage pumping stations to the left of the secondary substation in the visualization, and it supplies power to a telephone exchange. And all of these, therefore, also lose power. And this is an example of failures crossing between the networks and propagating outside just the area that is directly flooded. The digital twin is also able to query data from other knowledge graphs. And in the future, we would like, well, in the future, such data could be used to extend the capability of the digital twin. And I'm going to show two examples of where we've done this. Both are based on querying data from the World Avatar Knowledge Graph, which has been developed based on the work of Professor Marcus Kraft as part of an ongoing collaboration between CMCL Innovations, the University of Cambridge, and Cambridge Cares, the university's overseas research center in Singapore. And many of the ideas from this research have informed the design of what we've done in the Credo Digital Twin. In the first example, we demonstrate the inclusion of open data from the Environment Agency. And here you'll see a sensor that reports river level data. Clicking on the sensor allows us to interrogate the river level. And in this case, you see um, what was published by the Environment Agency is a live stream of data showing six hours of data from a tidal river at the tail end of Storm Franklin at the beginning of last week. And this demonstrates the possibility of how the digital twin might be extended to include information to support operational decision making. In the second example, we have retrieved open data about buildings from the Ordnance Survey. You should hopefully now be able to see some buildings on the map. These are color coded by use. So there's some educational buildings dotted around, and there's also a hospital at the top of the screen. 
In the future, the digital twin might be extended to describe the supply of services to buildings. So for example, the calculation of the criticality scores could then be amended to take account of the number of households supplied with services by a particular asset, or perhaps whether the assets supplied critical infrastructure, like a hospital or like an operating theatre within that hospital. There are many other ways in which the digital twin could also be extended in the future. For example, it could be updated to include the power connection to the mobile mass that you see here and here, and it could be extended to account for the mobile signal strength as a function of area around each of these mobile masts. It could also be extended to include a more detailed description of the assets or the connections. So for example, it might be extended to include details of the wooden pylons that form the, ba the physical basis of a number of these connections. And this of course could be significant because many of these wooden pylons are typically seen featuring in news reports about storm damage. Likewise, the information about the assets could be extended to include uh, data about the availability of backup power from batteries and from generators, and for example, the amount of fuel available for the generators, and work to extend the failure models to include these types of considerations is already underway. All of these extensions are likely to improve the ability of the digital twin to describe the behavior of the network. I hope this has given you a flavor of what the project team has been able to achieve over the last few months and how sharing data and connected digital twins might help us to understand systems better and to intervene more effectively in the future. Thank you for listening. Kirsten, back to you. Great, thanks Jethro. Yeah, it's really cool to see how it's all come together. Um, we'll be hearing from Jethro again uh, in the Q&A section. So if you have any questions for him, please start dropping them in the Zoom Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Um, that's rather than using the chat, please, uh, as we won't be collecting questions from the chat, only from the Q&A. So next I'll hand over to Matthew West, who is going to discuss the information management framework. Matthew? Hi, um, next slide, please. So yes, uh, we're, the information management framework is uh, a piece of work being done out of CPNI um, to develop what's needed to support data sharing. Next slide, please. Um, so the objective is that you can trust the quality of data that is shared, just as you trust the quality of water when you turn the tap on. Um, so you don't need to think about it. Um, you fixed it at source, just like we fixed the quality of water at source. Next slide, please. And next build. And again, and again. Okay, so this is the information management landscape, and this is the infrastructure that an organization needs to put into place um, in order to support the quality management of its information so that you can support uh, the vision. Um, and uh, next slide, please. Uh, the information management framework itself, the standards, guidance, and common resources to support the development of consistent information management landscapes that can therefore seamlessly share data. And a lot of that's in the bottom five circles that are orange there. Um, but it also includes um, guidance uh, to implement all the other bits as well. Next slide, please. Um, the way that we're building the, uh, the data models is, and, and reference data is using the thin slice approach. Um, and you can see uh, a representation of that here and next. And uh, Tom Burgoyne will be talking about the Anglian water thin slices in the next segment. Next slide, please. So uh, we've got quite some uh, achievements and learnings that have happened from this. We've been very pleased to work with Anglian Water in close collaboration, um, developing some thin slices. Um, but we've also learned, uh, we've not been as close as we'd like to be to Crater, but we've managed to still learn a great deal by watching what's been going on. 
Um, it's been a really good laboratory for us to see how data sharing happens and, and the issues in practice. And uh, in particular, we picked up the importance of data sharing agreements for collaboration and the challenges that there can be in getting those established. Um, and also the importance of organisational re readiness to implement thin slices. So um, it's, uh, it's a little bit like running a marathon. Um, if I went out to try and run a marathon tomorrow, I probably wouldn't get very far. But if I trained for six months, maybe I'd manage to get to the end. Um, and it's it's a bit like that with information management. You need to you need to have you need to be in a reasonable place um, to start doing these things. Next slide, please. So these are the next steps. Um, it's important to say that uh, this is just what we think needs to be done next. Um, uh, actually, it happening would be dependent on uh, funding proposals being approved, and that hasn't happened yet. And that's all I had to say, I think. Uh, next, if there is anything. Yep, there we go. Thank you. And back to you, Kirsten. Yeah, thank you, Matthew. It's uh, worth emphasizing that this work has really only happened over the last few months rather than being a, a longer term project. I don't know if that was clear from the beginning that it really has just been a couple of months of work. So as Matthew says, there's lots of future work to do, which is what we're trying to present here. Um, so now I want to hand over to Tom Burgoyne, who has been working with the Information Management Framework team, and will talk us through the practical considerations for the work that they did at Anglian Water uh, to move this prototype forward. Um, Tom, if you'd like to go ahead. Thanks, Kirsten. Uh, yes, so next slide, please. So yeah, my name is Tom Bergoyne. I'm the uh, technical lead on, from Anglian Water for the Credo project, and I actually work across the carbon neutrality uh, and enterprise data teams. Um, the Credo project is really quite appealing to me because it's, uh, it kind of hits that sweet spot because it's a climate-centric use case uh, built on flexible and scalable data architecture. So like many organizations, Anglian Water is going through a digital transformation and has been for, for a number of years. Uh, what I have on the slide here is actually uh, an illustration of the digital twin roadmap that we developed in 2019. Um, don't worry too much about the uh, the icons in terms of their sequencing. It's kind of showing a, an increasing capability um, as it advances through to 2035. Um, I also put on the slide here the net zero carbon roadmap. Um, and we have a strategy to get to net zero carbon by 2030. Um, and I'm absolutely convinced that uh, having an internal Anglian Water digital twin uh, will actually facilitate uh, achieving that goal. Uh, and indeed, uh, having a national digital twin would be even more powerful. Uh, but you may notice uh, that uh, 2030 and 2035, the dates don't quite line up. So one of the things we are hoping to achieve with the Credo project is to be able to accelerate our building of the digital twin. So my background is actually in energy optimization. Um, so I've been developing kind of uh, tools and applications over the years, which has meant that uh, even within a water industry, I've been having to pull together fused data between energy uh, and water and, in, and indeed uh, IoT devices, um, uh, all to kind of help us with our efficiency monitoring uh, and visualization. Uh, when you're working in this kind of environment, you've got to be quite focused on a specific use case uh, and actually you can develop something which can be quite powerful, uh, but ultimately the, um, uh, the final product may achieve that particular use case, but uh, you, we do find sometimes they're not so able to integrate more widely across the estate. Uh, so this actually led us to kind of thinking about uh, how to tackle this particular issue. And colleagues and colleagues and myself uh, have been looking at a, a, an approach called Trellis, which is time-bound resource-linked systems. Uh, it's try, trying to leverage a physical systems thinking approach uh, to, to give more consistency and clarity about our asset base. Uh, and we shared this with the IMF team uh, and actually found there was a, quite an uncanny alignment uh, with the IMF approach itself. Uh, but one of the key distinctions here is Trellis was more of a theory, whereas the IMF were actually bringing tools and uh, a method for implementing that in a, in a business context. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, looking now to the Credo data request itself, um, there, there's kind of two key work streams uh, being mentioned, the, the digital twin visualization, uh, led by CMCL uh, and the actual foundations led by the IMF team. Um, so we had to prepare the data request um, arguably to serve both of these purposes. So uh, in the first instance, CMCL, uh, absolutely they needed to, to get on with the work. We've talked about this only taking a few months. Uh, and so we had to take a slightly more traditional and pragmatic uh, uh, approach to actually pulling that data together. Um, Angley Water, like Many organizations uh, has kind of orga organically grown over the years and we have a federated estate of master data applications. So uh, we had data held in our um, SAP, which is um, our ERP system, uh, in GWater, which is our GIS system, 
in Iris, which is our telemetry system, as well as SQL databases and Excel sheets even as well. So the, the data was scattered across the, um, across the enterprise. Uh, and so I had to pull all this data, it kind of fell to me to pull all this data together. But one of the interesting uh, features of this is that uh, the data license of the legal obligations that we were, we were adhering to, uh, a nod towards the open data challenges that we uh, have been referenced earlier, uh, that um, required us to provide data in a geospatial area. Now, uh, that's easy enough from your GIS system, but actually when you start looking at your other systems, uh, it's actually not quite as immediately obvious. So what you actually need to do is uh, combine those data sets to make sure that you're adhering to the data license. So you actually have to make the data interoperable uh, before handing it over. And Tom Collingwood uh, referenced that in his slides ahead. Lots of data wrangling done there. Um, and that actually then presents an opportunity to do some cross-verification as well, to actually see how the data sets actually line up uh, and actually try and make them slightly more consistent to then hand to CMCL so they could really hit the ground running with building their knowledge graph. So this achieved both the tactical goal of getting that data to CMCL, uh, but it also presented a comparison for the, the more measured approach that the IMF would be, uh, would be adopting. So can you go to the next slide, please? So uh, in parallel, um, Anglian Water was able to commit to working with the IMF team uh, and uh, looking at uh, various kind of thin slices, which uh, Matthew just referenced a, minute, a, a moment ago. So uh, we selected our first thin slice out of the, the same data set that we're referring to here. Uh, we chose that um, to be the SAP function location uh, because it's a very powerful uh, and uh, detailed piece of information that Anglian Water used for identifying our assets. Um, it has various kind of classification information held within there as well, and it's importantly used all over the place. So it's not just held in SAP or not just used in SAP, it's actually used across the entire state. And so we brought to bear the IMF approach uh, on this, on this thin slice. Um, so it starts with data quality and ends with data quality. So the first step is to actually look within the thin slice uh, and, and make sure that we're improving the data quality such that when we mine the data out of that thin slice, uh, it's actually more meaningful, more useful. If you then take the, uh, the resulting information and you build a data model grounded in the borough top level ontology, uh, that's really trying to move towards that, uh, that common language, that more interoperable uh, way of describing that particular thin slice's data. Uh, but the really interesting things start happening when you actually move to the next thin slice, where you repeat the, uh, the process that I've just talked through of data quality, data mining, uh, and then building the model. Because uh, when you actually come to merge these two things together, it's uh, kind of similar to how I did it in a manual way before. Uh, but you start getting to see the, the differences and the discrepancies between these data sets. And with each merge of the model, the data becomes richer and closer to reality. Uh, but importantly, it's uh, done so in a, in, in a reusable and uh, more automated way, which uh, means that we get to do this um, more effectively in the future rather than the, in the kind of bespoke way that I have to do it in the pragmatic approach. Uh, and this really starts hitting some of the key principles we're looking for in terms of the digital reflecting the physical, physical uh, and uh, really searching for that one version of the truth. So next slide, please. So we had a really positive experience working with the IMF team. Um, absolutely, uh, we were learning the entire way through this process and trying to take that learning and embed it into Anglian water. Um, uh, obviously, we've taken the trellis idea itself, and that's now been uh, clearly enhanced by the IMF approach. And we're used, using that information uh, and that, that learning to inform the migration to our SAP for HANA products. So we're going through that migration at the moment. We also uh, shared the data quality techniques that were uh, identified with our asset intelligence team. So we're improving the, uh, the data in our, our core systems. Uh, and importantly, and what this slide is alluding to here is we, we gained funding for a, a number of projects through the Offort Innovation Fund. And we're calling out the, the one in the center most specifically, which is Safe Smart Systems. Uh, and that actually had the IMF listed as one of the foundational pillars of how we're going to approach that particular project, which is looking at, uh, at making a more automated um, water network of the future and is actually a, 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 going to be across the entire water industry, even though it's led out of Anglian Water and a, and a team. But obviously, really looking forward to participating in uh, Credo as it moves forwards. Uh, and I want to thank you for your time listening today. Thank you very much. Back to you, Kirst. Great. Thank you, Tom. Yeah, it's brilliant to see all this coming together. I can tell that this webinar itself is going to be a brilliant resource for um, you know people wanting to pick this work up. So now joining us um, is the heart of Credo, um, the asset owners and project sponsors. I'd like to introduce Richard Buckingham from Anglian Water. 
Matt Webb from UK Power Networks and Louise Krug from BT, our three participating network asset owners. And I'd also like to introduce Elena Coleman from Connected Places Catapult. So if I can just have the slides off and, and everybody uh, whose name I mentioned, uh, if you wanna turn your video on. Um, the first question uh, is for Yelena. Um, so at this stage of the project, um, as, it, as it's starting to wrap up, what do you see as the future plans for Credo? Well, given that uh, climate resilience and integrated infrastructure are both key strategic focus areas for Connected Places Catapult, we're very pleased to announce that CPC is going to be investing in further phases of Credo for the coming year ahead and potentially for following years as well. So the following phases will explore further the opportunities that have been showcased in this current demonstrator for anticipating and managing the impact of climate change on national infrastructure. For example, how interventions could be assessed within the digital twin with a view to creating a deployable tool for supporting decisions to increase resilience of the overall system. We're planning to do an initial consolidation phase of the current Credo demonstrator working closely with asset owners to understand their feedback on the tool. And this will lead to the scope for a phase two development of a Credo digital twin. So we're really looking forward to working with partners and the wider community to take forward learnings from this phase into future work. That's great news, thanks. Um, so Louise, Richard and Matt, um, I'll come to each of you in turn with the following question. So um, what do each of you see as the most important lessons learned and benefits derived from this phase of Credo? Um, Louise, if you'd like to go first. Uh, you're just muted, Louise. Apologies. <laughs> so um, most important lessons. I mean, basically, I think all of us are desperately seeking the tools and systems to help us make um, better choices. Um, and I think one thing, you know, the credo has shown us very strongly is how complicated uh, each of the, mod the, the modeling is, how much information is required. It's not necessarily easily discoverable. You know, you need to have climate models, topographic data, highways models. And the complexity of the analysis itself is all, you know, also difficult. Identifying the elements, the failure probabilities, you know, the drain blockages, sinkhole creation. And I think these are actually all reasons to build once and build it well and enable all the asset owners to benefit from one well-built system rather than each trying to essentially replicate the same bit of work over and over again. And that to me seems one of the benefits that I didn't expect at the start. That's great. Uh, Richard, how about you? What lessons learned and, and benefits do you see as being important? Well, I mean, I think it's fourfold, really. Firstly, uh, that data can be shared between infrastructure providers. Uh, I think secondly, that this data comes in different structures uh, and it can be synthesized so we can actually get a, a system to work. Um, next, we can understand the interconnected and interdependent nature of our assets. Uh, and then finally, we can start understanding the downstream impacts upon our assets uh, within the system and the system of systems, which means that we can start planning uh, for the future in a much more informed way. That's great. And and Matt, any follow up to that? Um, I agree with all the points made. I think um, the, the one of the key benefits is around the fact that we have been successful in demonstrating what a digital twin is truly about for many people it's it's a very conceptual thing and it, it it's it's something that i think um a lot of people struggle with in terms of what it actually is and means what it can do and being able to demonstrate that collaborative approach that richard just described the the whole project has been a learning curve on every single front but to end up with an output that brings that to life and can demonstrate in a tangible way the, the, the sustained benefit that can be achieved and something that can be built upon in many, many directions, I think is very powerful. So what we've learned gives us a great basis to move forwards from and will benefit this and other projects like it in, in future. Yeah, so Louise, to Matt's point, um, how does the Credo approach help break down siloed thinking? Um, have you found that the project has made progress in this area with respect to collaborating across disciplines and sectors? Um, yeah, the project definitely has um, made progress. Um, I think the key, I think, to avoiding the sort of silo thing, if you like, is that the people know each other, that they have common goals and common ways of describing problems and can collaborate without contradictory objectives. And so I think key to that have been things like the 
legal sorting out the legal framework and the system security as well as the urgency of like the problem of of climate resilience um, those stages have taken an awful lot of time an awful lot of effort um, but i think they don't detract from the solution they really are a key part of the solution that help us work together yeah um so matt in terms of risk management what kinds of risks does a project like credo present um obviously data sensitivity comes into this so um, you're touching upon siloed thinking and, and um, some of the challenges with opening up data um, are um, considerations that are changing rapidly across the utility sector. So within UK Power Networks and other energy organisations, there's been a huge amount of focus over the last couple of years on how do we break down those barriers and increasingly open up and share our data. Um, so for a project like this, it's really driving that forward and, and through the collaboration, through um, those shared common objectives that Louise just touched upon by aligning our thinking, understanding each organization's own constraints and challenges, because we are um, critical infrastructure owners and operators. We are commercial organizations. There will always be very real considerations and constraints that we need to be sensitive to. But by working through that, by having effective processes. So for instance, we've developed a triage process over recent years that allows us to risk assess what can we share, how and with who in a controlled manner so that we're not overstepping the mark but equally we're starting at a point of how open can we be rather than we won't share unless, unless we need to so that thinking is very very key but in terms of the risks they're always going to be there we cannot expose things that may um, allow somebody to target really critical infrastructure for nefarious intentions cyber security is high on a lot of people's agenda now the conflict with uh, Russia and Ukraine is is you know driving that even further at the moment and we need to be cognizant of things like that um, similar data privacy if there's a single asset providing a single customer there is legislation in place that limits our ability to share that so all of these considerations are there but it's making sure we go into these things with our eyes open with the right processes and considerations and not use it as a barrier Absolutely. Yeah. So we've heard about some of the risks of, of approaching this type of project. But um, Richard, how do you see, um, you know, the, the risks of not taking a, a credo style approach when it comes to things like climate change and managing resilience in, in the face of the, the recent IPCC report? You know, what are the risks of not doing this work? Well, I think by, by not doing it, um, all asset owners and I, the three obviously on the call today, but it's a much wider group of stakeholders. Uh, we all risk developing our own individual resilience strategies uh, without reference to everybody else. Uh, and it's likely that in the round that's going to cost more than it would if we all joined it up together. I mean, secondly, I think each company will address resilience in the context of their assets and the things that need to be protected, which doesn't necessarily uh, impact positively on, every, on, on others. Um, so by uh, it doesn't necessarily best deliver resilience in the overall system or system of systems, as we might call it. Yeah. Um, so, uh, Louise, following on from that, um, you know, we sort of talked about siloed um, resilience strategies. Uh, how would you see Credo contributing to a UK wide uh, resilience strategy um, and to your own organization's resilience strategy together? So um, I think it sort of contributes um, it helps us understand where to focus expenditure if we understand where the risks are um you know because all the investment decisions that we make we have to you know we have to prioritize uh, we haven't got infinite funds so we need to prioritize them in, in the right places and if we can discover that one area is a particular less risk for whatever reason that that then we we know where to go um it also tells us when we need to talk to the other asset owners, uh, maybe to collaborate together about enhancing the resilience of a, of a system in a particular area. And I also think um, it's going to be going forward a useful tool that could help us when reacting to events. I mean, even in its current essentially static state where it, it's not receiving um, regular updated information, it's still, I think, a useful tool that the emergency response teams that each of our organisations have could use to sort of you know, point at things, share things, talk together over. So I think a lot of different ways it could be very useful. Great, thank you. Yeah. Um, so obviously, um, we could have 
you know, just a, an hours and hours long conversation about, about all of these issues. Um, I think we'll have to leave it there. Um, but uh, actually, if you have any questions um, for these four, they'll be back later in the Q&A um, section. So if I can um, ask you guys to hold your thoughts <laughs> until then, and um, we'll return to the presentations. Um, so next, um, let's hear from Rachel Judson, who's uh, Credo's project manager and Holger Kessler of the Geospatial Commission. Um, and we're going to hear from them some of the lessons learned from this demonstrator and some of the commonalities that we can see with the National Underground Asset Register work. Um, over to you, Rachel. Morning. Um, thank you for joining us today, Holger. Um, so this is the first phase of Credo and it's drawing to a close now. We've been looking, at reflecting on the things that we've learned and how others might benefit from them. Um, the Credo project, as you know, seeks to bring together sensitive asset data from across data sectors, build a connected digital twin to provide insight into infrastructure interdependencies and allow collaborative decisions to maximise resilience across the whole system. So we see a lot of similarities between Credo and the work undertaken by the Geospatial Commission on the National Underground Asset Register, or NUAR, and um, would like to take some time today to look at those. Um, Holger, um, would you mind giving a summary of the project for those who are not familiar? <clears throat> great, and thanks for having us, and, and great to, to listen to everything that's gone on before, and, and great to see many of the same stakeholders in the room. So yeah, the Underground Asset Register is um, in the build phase. Um, we will, by 2024, deliver a, a national comprehensive um, digital interactive um, and secure map um, of all buried infrastructure um, of the United Kingdom, um, excluding Scotland, which has a system already in place. Um, and the main purpose is um, to, to um, create more efficiencies in uh, managing street works and, and safe digging. Um, and we're talking um, basically to all um, UK asset owners, buried asset owners, to share data through a central um, platform. That's great, it's so ambitious. Um, thank you so much. So when we looked at the lessons learned for Credo, we found that there were uh, three themes that really stood out. Um, the main thing uh, was because, as we've mentioned before, Credo as a project was only funded for 12 months, which makes for a very ambitious timeline. And the project required quite a lot of discovery work, discovery into the data Credo required, discovery of the data that the asset owners could source and share, and the availability and suitability of climate and flood data. All of this took a lot of time, which put um, pressure on the time available for the actual development. Um, once the data had been identified, we had to understand the security that would be required to store that data, who would need to access it and work with it. And we worked closely with the Credo Asset Owners and with the STFC, that's the Science and Technology Facilities Council, and with DAFNI, the Data and Analytics Facility for National Infrastructure, to set up a data exploration license that was then subsequently signed up to by each of the Credo consortium members and participants. We still have a lot to learn about the West way to set up these licenses, so how to enable other parties to sign up to them, what the impact of the restrictive licenses had when we came to using the data derived from the sensitive asset data. I think this is an area where we could learn from NUAR and from other legal arrangements such as data trusts. Um, also, I think, um, as with all projects, in my opinion, um, communication has been key to Credo. Um, you may well remember from a previous webinar, we had uh, the Credo film tomorrow today and the app that describes Dawn Ruby. And we've used those a lot over the last couple of months to um, help um, talk about what we're trying to um, develop and the reasons why we wanted to develop it. And it's been really essential to it. Um, but now we're into the second stage of, of the project where we have this development and the creation of a set of synthetic data has been really important to us to be able to create and test and demonstrate outside the restrictions of the data license. And in fact, that um, synthetic data will be available as part of the Credo legacy on the DT Hub. Um, Holger, what do you think are the most important learning points that others should be aware of if they're looking to get started on their own connected digital twin project like Credo or NUAR? Yeah, thank you, Rachel. And <clears throat> first of all, I want to 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 say that uh, we we are we are only tackling, and I've heard the word thin slice. Um, so with with new R, we of course we're only solving a very focused um, specific problem with um, sharing and uh, buried asset data, um, and it's quite the opposite to some of the ambitious um, aims 
um, and, and valid aims of, of an interconnected digital twin to, to um, you know, make predictions about future climate change scenarios. So we are we're very modest and, and honest that we're only solving, you know, here's my pipe. It's a certain uh, it's a certain type. It probably has a it should have a location. Um, it probably has a depth. Um, so we, we have a small a, a smaller scope, and that is useful in talking to the legal, the security, um, and also the commercial um, um, entities in the asset owners. And remember, all of it can only work if every asset owner shares. So I've already seen in the chat questions about the data sharing agreements. We also have an exploration license, but we're now are signing up asset owners to the full legal agreement with, between cabinet office and asset owners, which we call the data distribution agreements. And I can, I can say that we are, we have had requests, um, interestingly enough, um, worldwide um, and in the UK to share those. And we are going to make our best efforts to share as much as we can publicly, because a lot of work has gone into those data distribution agreements. Yeah. And I just quickly, just um, whilst we're on the slide, communication, absolutely. So um, the core principles of the cabinet office are trust, respect and collaboration and um, uh, talking to people and explaining and listening to previous failed attempts and building on existing initiatives is, is key. Mm, yeah, definitely. Um, so now that NUAR is in its next phase, what advice would you give, and I would include Credo in, in this, in the future phases of Credo, um, who are looking to continue or expand their digital twin? Have you had to readdress the security or the data sharing for this new phase? Yeah, so um, absolutely. We, As you go from a pilot where things are nice and happy and closed and, and only temporary um, so for six months, um, we, in, we absolutely indeed had to test our data sharing agreements both with the security services, so you've got CPNI in the room here as well, mm -hmm. and all the individual asset owners. So we've road tested the data sharing agreement with, with all the asset owners in the current, on, on the map you, thanks for that, uh, in the three um, pilot area, um, MVP areas in Northeast of England, um, Wales and London. There's a lot of data exploration agreements. It makes me weak at yeah. the knees. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, um, thank you so much, Holger. It's been a, a bit of a whistle stop tour, whistle, whistle stop tour this morning. Of course, but we're um, here. We're here for, for yeah, as you said, with the other panelists. We're here in the Q and A's, and thanks for thanks for having us. Much appreciated. No, absolutely a pleasure. Um, and um, so details about Newark can be found on the Geospatial Commission's um, gov.uk pages, and I think we'll be posting the link to that in the chat. Um, for Credo, all of our lessons learned will be published on the DT Hub in the coming weeks as part of the project resources zone. I really hope that you find them useful. Um, thank you very much. And back to you, Kirsten. Great. Thank you both. Um, and now over to Matthew Bell uh, from Frontier Economics, who's going to tell us about the ongoing work to assess the benefits of the Credo approach. Matthew. Thanks very much, Kirsten. Um, as Kirsten said, my name is Matthew Bell. I lead the evaluation and climate work at Frontier Economics. Um, Frontier Economics has been appointed to understand the expected impacts of Credo. We heard in that, in that discussion, in the earlier discussion, some of the views about the benefits arising from Credo, and it's our job, in a sense, to set out those impacts more formally within a framework that's recognized by government and others about whether and how to take forward uh, future investments or future, uh, future projects of this, of this nature. Our work is still ongoing, and so we'll have a, a sort of final report assessing the, the benefits by the end of March, which, uh, which will then be, then be available. I guess the, the core issue we are trying to understand is the size of the benefits of this joined up approach to climate resilience within a single digital twin compared to an approach where each individual network sets up its own approach to characterizing the risks, exactly as Richard Buckingham was articulating earlier. The key issue is whether a single modeling framework incorporating the interaction between different infrastructure networks is better than the separate models for each network, and if so, by how much and in what particular ways. So if we look at the next slide. There we go. We've divided the impacts or the potential benefits into the three categories that you see there around flood resilience information management and wider spillovers. Given the timing and where Credo is in its development, we're focusing this initial analysis on flood and information management, but clearly those wider spillover and benefits could be important and we've heard about some of them, some of them already today. 
it's still early days and, uh, and Credo and us obviously learning as we go, particularly on information management. So the actual modeling that we'll undertake will be indicative, but the framework will provide a clear classification of the benefits and will develop initial estimates of expected impacts of a more developed Credo model. As you can see on the slide, we then divide those benefits between different categories of stakeholders, the asset owners, residential and business customers, and wider society. This initial analysis focuses on quantification of the benefits from flood resilience to those different stakeholder groups, but can be then expanded to the other areas of benefit. We're seeking to build up the evidence base for the benefits from better understanding the relationship between the different infrastructure networks for the asset operators themselves, for the business and residential customers and society more widely. And final slide, please. If we build it all the way up, yeah, there we go. The benefits modeling will bring together those categories of benefits and stakeholder groups with future flood events. There are obviously lots of different flood scenarios that we've been hearing about based on the potential frequency of severe surface water floods out to 2050. We'll look at one particular scenario, but the framework and the modeling can look at, can clearly look at others. The impact model that we're producing reflects the fact that the Credo model itself is developing, as we've heard, and our impacts model will be capable also of further development, depending on the final forms of Credo and, and the digital twin. As mentioned, our final report will be available from the end of March and can then help to inform the case for future work and future development of Credo. Thanks very much. Great, thank you. thank you, Matthew. That's fascinating, and we're we're all looking forward to hearing uh, more about those benefits. So, our final presentation is from Sarah Hayes once again, who will be discussing some of the recommendations to those of you who are interested in collaborating on a Credo-style connected digital twin. Sarah, thanks, Kirsten. I'm going to keep it brief because we want to get onto those questions. So, next slide, please. So, during the course of the project over the last few months, a philosophy has emerged. Uh, make it work, then make it better. We found that we really had to start small and build it out. We've had to start simple, but set a vision so that we can introduce dynamic and live elements later on. We found it helps us to focus on a single use case to start with and one data set with the option to add in other data sets later on. And we found that being agile with a clear vision and the ability to plan is really helpful so that you can add in complexity as you go. And a lot of questions coming up in the chat sort of imply that you know, we, we've got this all singing and dancing digital twin that can help us make decisions um, about resilience right now. We're very much at the building block stages of that. And what we want to do now is to start, and start adding in more complexity into the Credo model so we can get it to the stage where it can help us make those really important decisions. So next slide. What we found has been really useful has been visualization. So at the very beginning, we had Sunford City with our fictional data and our fictional city, which was really helpful for sort of setting the vision for where we wanted to go with this, what we want to do with the Credo Digital Twin. And the next slide. Now we have a synthetic data set, which, which gives us this snapshot, which is really helpful for telling the story to be able to show where are the key interdependencies across the infrastructure system, what is the extent of failure when there is a, a flood, flood scenario, and when you start to um, incorporate buildings data and residential data, what, where are, which homes would be at risk in certain flooding situations, and what might be the, the status at the hospital, for example. And then the next slide. And now we have the visualization presented to you by Jethro today, where we use synthetic data. So this visualization is uh, available to you on the DT Hub. You can have a go, have a play around with it, and hopefully it'll be really useful to you. And the next slide. So we have a number of recommendations set out in the reports which are published on the, the DT Hub. There's a lot of detail in those recommendations, so I'm not going to go into that detail. I just wanted to pick out a few of the main recommendations. So shared data can highlight anomalies and offer immediate insights. As, as Jethro showed earlier, you know, when you just put the data together, you can see anomalies and you can start to see immediate insights. So when you bring data together across different sectors, you can see where the interdependencies are just by bringing that data together. We found that ontologies help with scaling up 
and knowledge graphs support ontologies. And finally, purpose and collaborative intent are essential. So going back to the Gemini principles, having a clear purpose for the digital twin and aligning everyone on that purpose is, is really important. And uh, as we know, collaboration is key. Next slide. So we, there are a number of directions that we can take Credo in, in the future, and hopefully some, this will answer some of the questions that be, have been coming up in the chat. But what we want to investigate in the future is possibly how we can share data directly, ultimately to be able to support live data connections. We can think, think about extending the digital twin to include roads and access and other coincident factors like wind. We might want to incorporate other use cases like extreme heat and then add in further complexity on system propagation. So be able to think further about criticality, number of customers impacted, recovery, and then start to look at interventions. So what are the interventions you would make to protect the, the system and to be able to simulate the effect of those interventions within the digital twin? And then to be able to think about taking Credo to other areas of the UK. And this really brings me to my last question here. Could you create your own Credo? And we really hope so. We really hope that the resources that we'll be publishing on the DT Hub and the links that will be provided to, to you over the next few weeks will help you create your own version of Credo. We're really keen to see that happen. And the next slide, please. And of course, it's, it's all about getting the right team in place. It's not about the technology, it is all about the people. So it's another huge thanks to the Credo team. Thank you. Yeah, that's, that's great to see. Um, there's so many places that it could go, um, but it needs to be driven from a purpose and, and what better purpose than making sure we're resilient to the climate emergency. So now joining us in addition to uh, many of our prior presenters are um, Sarah Snelson, Chris Dent, Matt Edwards, Ben Maudsley, and Robin Pinning. Ben and Robin have uh, taken over from Tom Collingwood as lead technical architect, so they'll be able to answer any questions arising from Tom's presentation about the technical development. We've already had a huge response um, in the Q&A, um, so uh, we may not be able to get to your question, and I'm, uh, I apologize if we, if we can't, but um, you can uh, continue learning and asking questions on the DT Hub if we don't get to your question today. Um, so if uh, the panel can turn their cameras on, uh, the first question we have is for Chris Dent. Um, what do you see as the successful outcomes for this first phase of Credo? Chris, you're muted. Uh, one, one outcome we haven't had is me learning to unmute when I have to speak. Uh, so we've already, we've already heard a lot about the learnings and outputs of the project, and I expect people will have uh, their own selection of points that are particularly of interest. Uh, so I'd, I'd highlight three points that uh, uh, I, I find particularly significant from my own perspective. Uh, one is simply the proof of concept and associated learning around how to build the end uh, to end digital twin. Uh, there's the combination of the technical work on use of climate and hydrology data in this application context, and then also the learning from that about uh, innovation, development, and deployment needs for uh, future work on use of climate model outputs for decision support in a scientifically sound way. Um, and there are always learnings that in some way you can anticipate, but one less anticipated piece of learning that I'd like to highlight is the need to uh, supplement uh, asset nameplate data that you get in traditional databases with other forms of information, such as expert knowledge on matters like failure, failure modes. Um, in order to build a meaningful digital twin. So as again, as we've heard, the uh, Credo team have plans to take these and other points forward and in particular to look at moving some of these outputs and learning towards field application. Uh, but in that spirit, uh, as Sarah said at the end, there's also a sense in which uh, the real success for the project is not what we do, but what other people such as yourselves do. Uh, so. Uh, if you would uh, like to use any of these learnings and outputs in your organizations, then we'd be very pleased to discuss uh, how our work can help you. That's great, thanks. Um, so a question for Sarah Hayes. Um, how easy was it to get data from the various asset owners and um, how were the agreements set up? What, what guarantees were needed to prevent some of those risks that were discussed earlier uh, with security? 
Yeah, so it's all about the data license. Um, and to set up the data license, you need to set out very clearly what the purpose of the project is and um, to be able to have an idea of what your project plan is. You need to be able to tell that to the lawyers so they fully understand what this is all about and can craft the data license appropriately. So you know, once you've got those things in place, then yes, it's easy to get the data because everyone has agreed to it, but it's absolutely crucial to, to have that data license set up. And, and I'm sure Louise will say um, a few more words from her perspective. Um, yeah. How easy is it to get the data? Not at all easy to get the data. Um, the data is sensitive. Uh, you know, we're all very aware of, of the risks. Um, you don't want to make it easier for people to work out what particular bit of wire to, to snip that will take down not only the telecoms networks, but also the water and the electricity in a particular system. You know, the risks are, are huge. And so it's not just about getting that data sharing agreement, if you like. There was also a, a lot of discussions around um, what are the security mechanisms on the Daphne platform all these had to be sort of talked about thought through before we could ever get to the stage whereby the lawyers would even really be, be happy to, to sign any agreement um, and then even within the organization uh, people are still can be very reluctant they need to, to, to see if you like what the benefits could be because trying to share the data without understanding the potential benefits and I think that's where the um, the Credo video in particular that we showed at COP26 really helped. It, it, it helped reassure people that there was a real purpose, um, a real worthwhile purpose behind it to, to help overcome some of their fears and, and reluctance, historic reluctance. Don't share anything if you don't have to. It's safer that way. <laughs> yeah. Holger, I think you had a, a follow up to that. Yeah, thanks for giving me a quick time. I just on behalf of um, CPNI and the National Cyber Security Center, who've been working both with with uh, um, new our underground asset register and, and Credo, of course, just to to reassure um, um, everybody listening that we are absolutely um, following all all the advice to build security minded systems. And one key principle, which links to Sarah's um, point right at the end, is um, to focus absolutely clearly on a on a on a use case and the users. Um, so the question that CP and I always ask is, who needs to, sue, to see and use the data in order to make um, an intervention or, or a better system and, and think about that first, as opposed to the other way around and make everything available to everyone and then think, what is it useful for? So just to reassure everyone that we are absolutely um, security um, mindful in, in everything we do. Yeah, that's a really important point to make. Um, there's a question here for Matt Edwards. Um, it would be interesting to know what partner organizations see as the benefits in uh, resilience relative to cost of protection and cost of developing the twins. What's the sort of cost benefit analysis from your perspective, Matt? Thank you for the question. Uh, it's a big question. Uh, thankfully, I think it builds on many things that others have said, including Matthew Bell. Yeah. So I, I think I, I want to just chunk it down a little bit. Firstly, what we do know as asset owner operators is that the cost of reacting is far more than the cost of being proactive and planning how we do things. Two, three, four times the cost. I suppose I'm very aware that those historic costs are based upon the historic scale of impacts. And I think what we're looking at now, and the demonstration is brilliant at pulling that out, is that, is that baseline is probably moving. Yeah, the, the cost of reacting is probably going to increase. Secondly, I mean, Matthew, Matthew Bell touched on this. Um, we don't know the, uh, uh, the comparison between the cost of an individual solution versus the, co the cost of a collective system solution. But wouldn't it be amazing if one day uh, a water company might give up some of its income or its expenditure to an energy company because that was the right solution for all? Yeah. I don't know how far off we are that happening. The third thing that strikes me about it is the cost of digital twins. I genuinely don't know what they are at the moment. We're, we're endeavouring to build some, our first endeavours now, and we've put, put some prices on it, but they are also the first iterations, aren't they? And like anything in the digital world, the more you aggregate it, the more you build on it, the more the, the, the cost efficiency improves. So I don't know, but, but I suppose the, the most important point to me, my last point is probably a, a point about value as opposed to cost. 
because I think what we're talking about here is value. Yeah, it's easy to go down to pounds and pence. But what I loved about this opportunity to work with UK Power Networks and BT Open Reach was the fact that in one space, we all plug into the same properties. We all share customers and we are all customers. Uh, and when you see a scale of impact like that, how do you put a price on 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 doing and solving things the right way to collect collectively. I don't know how to put a price on that. I'm genuinely interested in what Matthew Bell is going to come out with, but I can't help but think that there's a huge card to play here by government uh, and regional organisations and councils and regulators, because that value proposition is as much theirs as, well, all of ours, as it is an individual asset owner operators. So we've got to do a lot of work together to, to come up with a justification that we're all bought into. Thanks. That's great, yep. Um, so question here for Jethro. Um, you mentioned the use of top level ontologies on top of data level ontologies to create knowledge graphs to combine the data from several domains. At GeoNovum uh, Netherlands, we're developing an architecture for ecosystem of digital twins. Which lessons did you learn in your credo project uh, related to this? Thank you. Interesting question. I mean, in my, in my talk, I mentioned the World Avatar Project, which is a research project that we've been involved with for more than 10 years. And that's really informed much of the approach that we've taken in the digital twin, in the Credo digital twin. And fundamental to that is the idea that the knowledge graph should be dynamic, that it's operated upon by computational agents that extend it by drawing in new data, and that the agents are represented in the knowledge graph. And we do this to confer interoperability, not just in terms of data, but also in terms of the models. And you know, this is one way of connecting digital twins. So having multiple models or multiple agents all operating on and sharing the same data and therefore interacting with each other with the term, in terms of things calculated by one model being used to inform the other. And specifically in Credo, I think the main lesson that we learned was the benefits of structuring the ontologies in a hierarchy. So we had a high, I wouldn't necessarily call it a top level ontology, but we had a higher level ontology that we used to define generic concepts for everything that's described in the Credo digital twin. And then as far as possible, we use these generic concepts when we define the business logic of the digital twin. So when we wrote the code where we have to query the digital twin or calculate things upon it, all of this code, all of these queries are defined in terms of those higher level, um, higher level concepts or concepts from that higher level ontology. And in contrast to this, the details of the different types of asset for each network are defined in terms of lower level ontologies that are specializations that inherit from that higher level ontology. And this means that we can add new details, new types of assets for the, uh, in this case, water, telecoms, energy, or indeed we could add whole new domains. And we could do this in a way that we wouldn't disturb the higher level concepts and we wouldn't disturb the logic of the digital twin operating upon them. So, so I think that that would be my lesson that you can use this hierarchy to give you the abstraction that translates both into interoperability and into extensibility. Thank Thanks. you. Yeah. Uh, and Chris Dent, um, how do you ensure that your climate model data inputs are valid given that storm events are expected to worsen in the future? You know, we can't use sort of the historical record anymore because every storm seems to be unprecedented. So how do you make sure the data is accurate? Thanks. I, I uh, there the um main source of information is uh, on future climate is uh, climate modeling studies uh, the fundamental challenge there is that climate is very complex and uh, and the computer models used are therefore correspondingly complex uh, and um, uh, there are there are many challenges around uh, building the uh, uh, around uh, producing the necessary input data for this kind of decision support purpose uh, when you don't have the ability to do bespoke uh, supercomputer runs of your climate model for all applications. Um, in Credo, we've been looking at uh, uh, 
what best practice is for use of um, the, uh, for use of the present UK climate projections project uh, in, uh, uh, in in terms of the the outputs from the UK climate projections uh, in uh, how one can um, uh, work within current industry practices so for instance pro providing a little bit more realism around the kind of storm events uh, that, that are considered i mean look, looking to the future uh, one topic for innovation would be uh, would be working out how you would be um, providing guidance or methodology on how one can couple this climate data to, again, computationally challenging hydrology models, which are required for flooding purposes. And then looking to longer research timelines, there's a, there are real opportunities around uh, how one can provide richer information through general purpose products like UK climate projections, or maybe for very large scale applications, how one could even even do bespoke runs of climate models with future generations of high performance computing. And on, on the specific, I think there are, there are uh, one way of uh, phrasing the question would be to say, uh, how do we ensure accuracy of climate data? I think a different way when fundamentally we're dealing, uh, when we're dealing with these questions about the reasonably far future, we're we're in, we're, we, got, we often have considerable uncertainty around projections is looking at how can we how can we appropriately manage that uncertainty as to what future climate will look like so as to take uh, take planning decisions today. Great, thank you. Yeah, unfortunately, we're desperately running out of time and we have so many great questions to get to. Um, our panelists have assured us that um, they're willing to answer any of the questions that we've collated from the Q&A later. We'll post those um, on the DT Hub along with the webinar video. Um, so thanks to our panelists. Uh, but one final question for Elena. Um, I was wondering, um, what are the priorities uh, moving forward and, and what's the benefit more broadly in continuing with this kind of work? Sorry, we'd come off mute. So in terms of priorities for the upcoming phase, we are looking to develop new use cases for the existing asset owners, but we also want to bring on board additional data sets and new asset owners to create a more robust picture of the dependencies. So if you are an asset owner and you're on the call and, and the webinar today, please do get in touch if you're interested in being involved going forward. Um, some of these things have been mentioned before, but looking at streamlining data sharing agreements to see how we can make that process more smooth. We want to understand the consequences of cascading effects across a whole system or a network. And we want to demonstrate the application of emerging standards and also making sure that the project feeds into a wider ecosystem. So we've heard from UI, there are also other projects like the uh, Digital Connectivity Infrastructure Accelerator, um, and we really want to make sure that industry, academia, and government thinking is all aligned in this area. So those are some of the priorities. And in terms of the benefits, Credo is really a project that helps to break down barriers to data sharing, and it showcases how collaborative approaches to data-driven data decision-making um, can really support operational and strategic decisions about infrastructure management. Um, it can really reinforce what happens in a very uncertain and complex context with lots of increasing system interdependencies. So Credo has many benefits. And as we've heard from Frontier, we're looking to quantify these. We will also look to do a benefits analysis after the further phase of Credo to explore how the next stage of development um, has been producing some of those benefits. Great, thank you. And thank you, panelists. I think we'll have to wrap it up there. Um, thanks to those of you who submitted questions as well. Um, finally, I want to hand over to Mark Enzer, who is director of the Center for Digital Built, Built, Built Britain, as well as the head of the National Digital Twin Program and the chief technical officer for Mott McDonald for some final reflections. Over to you, Mark. Thank you very much indeed. And thank you, everybody. Uh, I think Credo is amazing. Uh, I believe in Credo. Uh, that's, I put that one in there for the, the Latin fans. Um, I mean, Credo is what it's set out to be. It's a tangible working example of connected digital twins. I mean, it really shows the benefits of information flow across organizational sector boundaries. It's, it's given us so many other lessons, though, and has totally underlined this thing that uh, the National Digital Twin Program really is a socio-technical change program. You know, we've got to address the, the, the kind of the human side, too. So, so 
the credo has been amazing. Um, you've heard that hopefully it's going forwards and will be amazing. Uh, and so really what I, I just wanted to do to, to conclude was just to give absolutely massive thanks to the Credo team. Um, there, there have been kind of thanks all the way through this. People have, have been so appreciative of each other. Uh, but you can kind of see um, how collaboration matters in this, because I think when it comes down to it, uh, what we're talking about here um, is, is it's all about connections. It's connections connecting digital twins but it's also connections between people. It's all about connections. Uh, and the Credo team has shown that in, in spades. So, you know, thanks to the owner operators, to the research and other partners. Um, Kirsten, you've done the most amazing job. I think there's a job in TV for you. Uh, but I just did want to particularly embarrass uh, Sarah and Rachel uh, because uh, their uh, leadership and management skills have, have basically enabled all of this to come together. So I, I hope we can kind of all recognize uh, and appreciate just what an amazing job they have done, but what an amazing job the whole team has done. Thank you. It's amazing. Thanks, Mark. So, uh, you know, just as a, as a final uh, note, if you're interested in learning more about the Credo project, the place to go is the Digital Twin Hub. Um, there you'll find the technical reports discussed earlier, and in the coming weeks, we'll be adding reports on the benefits and outcomes of the project, as well as lessons learned, legal templates, and plenty of other resources to help get you started if you're interested in picking up the Credo model for connecting digital twins. Also, don't forget our weekly Gemini call Tuesday mornings at 1030, where you can hear from various organizations developing their own digital twins, ask questions and share knowledge. Uh, details to, for how to sign up to that are also available on the DT Hub. We hope we'll see you there. Thanks so much, everybody. Have a good day.